This conference will now be recorded.
राहुल सर कैन यू हियर मी राहुल सर राहुल सर कैन यू हियर मी
अभी राहुल सर कैन यू हियर मी यस यस आई एम ऑडिबल राइट या या करेक्ट Would you try uh, sharing the screen? Yeah, it's yeah. coming. Okay. So welcome everyone once again. So this is the second session of the Atal FDP. So it's my pleasure to introduce our resource person for the second session, Dr. Rahul Saha of NIIT Hamirpur. He is going to talk to us on the very important topic of nanofluid enhanced soil recovery. Dr. Rahul Saha is currently working as a assistant professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering at National Institute of Technology, Hamirpur, Himachal Pradesh, India. Prior to that, he was working as an assistant professor in the School of Petroleum Technology at Pandit Dindayal Petroleum University, Kandinagar. He received his PhD degree in chemical engineering from Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati, in 2019. His research area are, were focused on various chemical enhancer recovery schemes, which involved the application of chemicals like uh, alkalis, surfactants, polymers, and their combination for improving oil recovery from reservoirs. In addition, he was further involved in injecting nanofluid in oil reservoirs to identify the potential of nanofluids for higher residual oil recovery. He did his master's in chemical engineering with specialization in petroleum science and technology from Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati, working in the area of biodiesel production from non edible oil using ultrasonication method. His bachelor degree is in chemical engineering from Pune University, India. So far, he has published several research articles in internationally reputed journals and has reviewed numerous technical articles for reputed journals like Well, Energy, MDPI, etc. He has recently published a book in CRC, Press, Taylor & Francis, and two books Book chapters in Springer Nature. He is also a life associate member of IICHE and an editorial board member of American Journal of Chemical Engineering. He has successfully conducted several academic events, which includes workshops, short term courses, Atal FDP, and many more. He's also, he was also engaged as a person for several ex expert lectures in various institutes. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Rahul Saha. Over to you, sir. Rahul sir, you can so, start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there was some network issue. I hope so. It got disconnected. So I, I can start now, right? Yeah, yeah, you can start. So can you confirm if my screen is visible? Yeah, it's visible. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So thank you, uh, Dr. Anjan, for giving me uh, giving your introduction. <clears throat> I hope I'm audible. So today we are going to talk about. Uh, yeah, once again, I would like to thank the committee member and uh, everyone involved for inviting me to this talk. 
and today we are going to have a talk on a topic that is just just a minute i'll just i don't know how to minimize this Nice. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So today we are going to talk about the topic that is your nanofluid uh, emulsification for enhanced soil recovery application. Okay. So, as uh, in, as uh, introduced in the in my biosketch, as I was working in this chemical enhanced soil recovery. So this talk is not on this exactly on the chemical enhanced recovery. Oh, but I'll cover a part of this chemical enhance or recovery and then I'll jump into this nanofluid emulsification and the different properties that are nowadays in huge those are you can say a kind of emerging uh, technology that has been on the stage of implementing the reservoir for improving the oil recovery. Okay, so we all know what actually crude oil is. So these are you know it's not natural occurring thick dark brown flammable liquid as you can see in the image given here. And this crude oil, you know, it has a very huge, you know, very complex structure, which, uh, mixture. And as it says, it is being formed by decomposition of aquatic plants and animals that is buried underground under intense heat and pressure where it is being cooked to form this uh, blackable down from a dark blackable flammable liquid. Uh, we call it a crude oil and some of the composition you can see these are paraffin aromatic naphthalenes and other hydrocarbons and if you see we this price of the crude oil you know, it causes inflation and affects the price of almost everything that we use in our day-to-day -day life and that's why we call it as black gold and because of this the, uh, the price of the crude oil in the international market is being controlled by the opec bodies those are the organization of the petroleum exporting countries, such as you can see in the screen given here, like Algeria, Equator, most of the Middle East countries. So they control the price of this crude oil across the globe. Okay, so let's go to the application part. So we all know when we distill this crude oil, you know, all the products that we're getting from this crude oil are being used for several applications. You can see in the refinery gas as a petrol in car, naphtha, kerosene, diesel. And the remaining residue is being used for construction, you know, like aspartame for construction of coal and all. So almost all the products that we are getting from this crude oil is being used uh, for several applications. And this is a downstream part, which I'm not going to cover here. And at the middle image you can see here. So if you see here, almost the almost every product, most of the product that we use in our day-to-day -day life are being derived from this petroleum product. So that's why you can see how important it is and how it is going to be act as an important source for energy demand and supply in coming future. And this is the slide from the right extreme right. You can see we have a scenario of the Indian and the world world production and consumption scenario scenario. So if you see in the last few decades, the production and consumption, you know, how it is increasing. Know, and it is expected to increase in the same fashion in the coming few years. And if you see the rate at which India is importing this crude oil, you know, you can see we are almost importing around 75 to 80 percent of the crude oil just to meet our internal energy demand. So that's why even Indian reserve are also looking for some enhanced method that they can use such technology to improve the recovery of the crude oil so that they can meet the energy demand. Yeah, so we, we know we have a crude oil, and once we drill it, the crude oil is coming to the surface. So this is, if you can see in this image, the crude oil is there, and it is coming to the surface when we drill it. And the initial production that is actually happening in the industry, oil and gas industry, it is coming out to the surface because of the natural press. But the problem is, we cannot recover you know, this crude oil beyond certain level because this natural pressure which is there, this pressure is it has declined after a certain period of time and the production rate it goes down so to maintain this pressure and to eject this 
uh, crude oil through this pipe into what is the surface, what we do, we drill another well and then we inject this water, which pushes this crude oil and it comes out to the surface. But if, if you see here, whether you use primary or a technology, we call it a secondary water flooding, you cannot recover more than 30 to 35 percent. And this is why, you know, because why, when we inject water, this oil and water are invisible, so they causes a viscous simmering effect and because of which, you know, the crude oil gets trapped inside the pores of the reservoir rock and it could not be produced to the surface. So that's why we, uh, we are going for this different schemes that are available. We call it tertiary and then soil recovery schemes that are being implemented in the reservoir to take it to, to take this residual oil to the surface. So a lot of tertiary oil recovery schemes are there and there are several guidelines that decide on which your scheme we are going to implement depending on the various properties like the reservoir depth, crude oil properties, rock properties and several other factors. Uh, so the tertiary oil recovery schemes you can see here, these are thermal in which we inject steam, hot water or we burn a portion of the crude oil, we call it as combustion. Other alternatives like in gas injection, you can use CO2 gas, hydrocarbon gas, nitrogen or flue gases. So these are different schemes. But here in this talk, we're going to talk about the chemical, which, which implements the chemicals like alkali, surfactant, polymer, and all inside the reservoir to take this crude oil to the surface. And apart from that, the other property is injection of nano fluid, which is, as I informed you, there's a latest technology which people are using nowadays to enhance the recovery, <clears throat> which we're going to discuss in a while. And if you see this image, this is the Indian scenario, which says the reason why share of reservoir, reserves of crude oil in India. Yeah, so what is enhanced oil recovery? This is, I told you, a part of a tertiary oil recovery scheme. And enhanced oil recovery is a process of increasing the oil production from reservoir. And chemical, as, as we're going to focus on this chemical here, this is simply the injection of alkali surface and polymer, which you can see in this diagram. This is the pictorial view. This is the oil zone. We inject different chemicals like alkali surface and polymer in different slugs, and followed by this chase water. So this pushes the crude oil to the surface. And you can see this is a top view. This image shows how the oil is effectively being displaced by avoiding, I mean, so by minimizing the residual oil <coughs> saturation. And this is the other image which we are going to discuss is about the nanofluid, how we inject nanofluid inside the reservoir, which maintains more or less the same properties like chemical ER, and then we can get this oil to the surface. <coughs> What are the mechanisms that we are going to discuss? So, the first and important thing is a dimensionless number, we call it as capillary number. So, this capillary number is nothing, it is a ratio of your viscous forces to the interfacial tension. So, what if it, uh, there is a study that is being uh, conducted by several researchers where they have observed that. Once they increase this capillary number to a certain duration, the crude oil that is there initially, which is being trapped, could be recovered as we keep on increasing the capillary number. So this is the diagram which shows here as we go on increasing the capillary number for different reservoirs, you know, they have these properties of reducing the residual oil saturation, which means we are getting more crude oil to the surface as we go on increasing the capillary number that depends on the reservoir property. So what is this capillary number? As I told you, it is the ratio of viscous forces to the interfacial tension, which you can see here. So our ultimate aim is to use some chemicals, you know, like alkali surfactants, polymers, who can effectively increase this capillary number so that we can recover the crude oil. So if you see the first chemicals that we inject are alkali. So what alkali it usually does? So this alkali it interacts with the crude oil. You can see we have a crude oil. This is a crude oil. This alkali is interacting with the crude oil and form this in situ surfactant. Now, this in situ surfactant are being stayed at the interface. And once you remove this in situ surfactant, I mean, so when this in situ surfactant are being 
taking the position at the all vertical interface, you can see the interfacial tension is reduced between these two phases. And once you can see, in, this is the initial condition where we have a very high interfacial tension, the all is trapped between this rock course. And this is happening because we are doing this water flooding. So you can see here, this is the water and this is the oil, those are trapped between the rock. And as we inject this alkali, because of this reaction mechanism, you can see here, this is reducing the interfacial tension. And once it is reduced, you can see the oil which is trapped, which is how, how it is being squeezed out from this trap pore. And thus you can see as we keep on reducing the interfacial tension, the oil starts flowing between this rock. So this is one of the properties through which you know oil could be moved through this pores, and this is also results in improving your capillary number. Is one of the chemical effectiveness in, in improving the capillary number. So that's why I said even to reduce the interfacial tension, the oil could be recovered, and this not only uh, improves the oil recovery, this actually improves because of the displacement efficiency. So you can see here. When, when this is being moved through this pores, the microscopic and macroscopic displacement efficiency are being improved. So you can see here, this is this is the additives. This is what we inject into the reservoir. So this is the ER solution followed by your chase water. And you can see oil is being taken out of the surface, more or less the similar diagram as we have given as we have seen earlier. And what it does, you can see this is the microscopic displacement efficiency, which is removing the oil from the pores of the rock. So this is this is the pores, and the macroscopic means it is covering different area of the reservoir. So you can see it is covering all the area of the reservoir. So thus it is removing the oil from the pores, which is microscopic, and it is covering more area of the reservoir where the rocks oils are trapped. So thus ultimately improving your. <coughs> Uh, uh, displacement efficiency of oil, and thus we can have a very higher oil recovery. So we have done some experiments that we are going to see in a while. The other things of the chemical that we use are the surfactant and the polymer. So as I told you, when you use this surfactant, so suppose as I told you, the interfacial tension reduction phenomenon is a property of the crude oil and the chemical. But when this crude oil and chemical Alkali are not effective in reducing the IFT to a ultra low range. What we do, we add additional surfactant. If this additional surfactant, it goes and sits at this in situ surfactant, reduces the IFT to an ultra low range, and thus you can see the IFT is reached to an ultra low range, followed by this emulsification. So, this reduction in IFT also results in emulsification of the crude oil and also a change in the weightability alteration of the reservoir. Now, what actually this weightability alteration is? So you can see this is a sample. This is the oil sample, you know, and, and these are the rocks, OK? So you can see these are three different cases. First is the water weight in which the water is there at the outer periphery of the rock, and oils are at the center of the pores. And there's a mixed case where oils are at the outer periphery, and waters are also at the outer periphery. So this is a mixed kind of behavior. And this is only oil weight, where the oils are, uh, stick to the outer periphery of the rock surface, and waters are at the pores. So mostly the reservoir that we have are either oil weight or water weight. So when we use this surfactant, this surfactant it interacts with this aqueous oil phase, and it replaces Either if it is oil weight or mixed weight, it replaces the weightability towards the favorable water weight, where you can see where waters are at the outer periphery and oils are at the center pores. So it can easily be taken out to the production platform when we use this surface. So weightability alteration is also one of the process that is responsible for recovering the chloride. And you can see we have this solid rock surface. This is the rock surface and this is the oil. So when we use nanofluid, nanofluid properties is also I'm going to discuss. You can see this nanofluid, whatever is there, it is forming a kind of wedge film, you know, at the solid and oil interface. And this is pushing it. So the structural design pressure gradient you can see here. So this pushes this oil and this oil surface is replaced by the water phase. This is what we have just seen as they're going from mixed weight or oil weight towards the water weight. So nanoparticles 
in the nano in the nano solution you can see what are their importance and how they are effectively enhancing the weightability when they are being implemented with in the reservoir fit and the last is the polymer flooding as i have told you since water is a big problem when we do this water flooding it keeps it decides more of the oil underground so you can see here this is the case this is the injection we give this water flooding and this is bypassing and it is coming out to the production platform so you can see a lot of the crude oil you know in this sites are being trapped and this is not favorable so that's why a huge amount of the crude oil decides and we cannot take it out to the surface so when we use these chemicals the polymers it maintains this mobility ratio so when this mobility ratio which is the mobility of water with that mobility of oil when we keep it less than one it is favorable condition in such cases the water will try to push the oil to the production platform like a piston surface and here you can see almost most of the crude oil which are trapped here is being now taken out by this water because it is pushing it to the production platform and thus you can see a higher oil recovery could be attained when you have a proper selection of the chemical and how it interacts with the rock in the crude oil and uh, important thing is there are a lot of parameters that you have to look into when you're looking this chemical when you're looking into this chemical it was seems okay so like the ph of the system what temperature because if you inject whether it is chemical or nanoparticle how it is interacting at the reservoir temperature what is the ionic strength you'll be having divalent ion monovalent ion how they are interacting with the chemical as well as the nanofluid okay what is the geological formation okay and and another important thing which i didn't mention is the adsorption so you can see here when you're using this alkali it is going and interacting with the rock surface and it is having your adsorption behavior on the rock surface so this rock adsorption of this chemical on the rock surface will add to some cost so we are also looking into some uh, properties how we can minimize this adsorption of chemical and all these are dependent on the factors that we have just explained and the desired properties when you're going to screen or you going to select a chemical for a reservoir you have to make sure that these are less adsorbed these are stable at different saline and temperature condition and these are effective in enhancing your oil recovery by activating the mechanisms that we have just discussed in a while okay few minutes back whatever you have discussed this alkali surfactant and polymer is all are responsible in a, this acts in a synchronizing manner to recover the crude that is there which is being trapped in the underground surface because of the water flooding as you can see in this case so how now the question is how do we do that in the reserve okay. so a little bit introduction has been given to you okay. and now the question is how do we mimic this condition in the reservoir and how do we do this experiment how do we predict that what could be the possible outcome for the chemical you are okay so we do all the screening criteria and how we have done it we will discuss it but you see here this is the laboratory setup that we have used to do our flooding experiment so this is a schematic diagram you can see so what we do we take a cut pieces of the rock sample from the field of size that is equivalent to the size of the reactor which is around 3.6 inch in diameter and around 12 inch in length we cut this rock piece we put it into this reactor and then we what we do we, when we are producing the water or oil we are also getting water with it so we took that water we analyzed that water and we prepared that synthetic formation water in our lab that formation water which we are supposed to assume that it, it is initially there in the reservoir we inject that water into this rock sample and then the crude oil we inject it okay so we assume that initially there was water and then crude oil is being formed in some source and it is flow source rock and it is flowed and trapped into a location so this is by assuming that in a phenomena we have injected this crude oil and it is being accumulated here we get around 80 to 90 percent of the saturation of the crude oil and 10 to 20 percent of the prime depending on the reservoir porosity and probability and once we reach this reservoir condition what we do we keep it under certain pressure and temperature which is being facilitated by the system and once we, the reservoir condition is achieved then we inject this chemical like how i have shown in the diagram 
this is this is the, this is the pectoral diagram we inject this chemical followed by the chest water to predict the recovery so the oil that is coming out is being collected in a collector and we estimate the crude oil the crude oil that is initially there in the rock sample by methyl balance and the oil that is being taken out by the help of this chemical so that way we can use and all the system is being the pressure transducer reading and all these readings are being recorded into the system software. You can use all this data to plot your graph and you can easily predict the cumulative oil recovery with the injection of your chemical and water slurp. So plotting parameters like screening of chemicals, chemical composition, the slug size, the injection pattern. So, so we have to identify the optimum chemical slug and then we inject we identify all these parameters and then finally we pick what is the oil that is being we can take it out from the reservoir by conducting this laboratory flooding experiment. So this is the same diagram we have just explained. We have the rock sample, we saturate it with brine, as I told you, then we saturate it with crude oil, then we measure the brine permeability and from here we measure the porosity and permeability by material balance simply and this gives us the estimation of the initial oil inflex. We do water flooding, chemical flooding, and then chest water flooding. And then from here, water flooding gives you the secondary recovery. And after that, the tertiary oil recovery is being estimated in the percentage of residual oil recovery by performing the chemical and chest water. Similarly, goes with the nanofluid. So in place of chemical, here we are just replacing it with nanofluid and exactly the same method we follow. A little bit of the chemical yield, then we will go with the nanofluid. So what we do exactly in chemical QR is this is one of the experimental data which I'm producing here. The first thing that we have done in our lab was exhibiting the alkali flooding and just to see how effectively we can recover this food oil with the help of alkali. Okay. So we take the crude oil, it's a very simple crude oil, light crude oil. And we, we have prepared a sand pack. Okay, so initial experiment we have taken sand particles and then we have prepared a sand pack in the laboratory, and in that we have performed our experiment. So the first thing we, we did is we analyzed the crude properties and we have seen how what are the different parameters like API gravity, acid value, and all. Okay, and then we have interacted with different uh, calories like uh, uh, different alkalis. NOH and sodium carbonate. So in the first thing is what we have taken NOH. We wanted to analyze how this interacts with, the, with our crude oil. So we take this crude oil from Assam oil field. So the crude oil and alkali are being reacted. So there is a there is a setup we call it spinning dot tensiometer. This is an analytical technique through which we can measure the interfacial tension. So we take alkali of different concentrations, like 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and 1. And at different alkali concentration, we react the oil and the food oil in this spinning drop tension meter. And then we analyze how the interfacial tension it reduces. So you can see this diagram. This is a time dependent behavior. Interfacial tension is a time dependent variable. So what we did, we interact once we interact this alkali and the crude oil. We observe there is a formation of in-situ surfactant. Now, when this in-situ surfactant are being formed at the interface, it, it, it is either getting it at the at the very beginning, it starts accumulating at the interface. So the adsorption process of the uh, in-situ surfactant at the interface is pretty high. Then with time, what it does, it's the desorption rate, it starts increasing slowly. Okay, and finally, a time is reached when both the rate of adsorption and the rate of desorption are in equilibrium, and that is the point which we say those are the equilibrium IFT. Okay, so you can see the dynamic IFT is what we're talking about. So it depends on the rate of adsorption and desorption. So you can see the IFT it starts slowly increasing, slowly decreasing, increasing, and then flatness out. Whereas at, at, at lower concentration, you can see it is more or less flat, whereas at higher concentration, you know. It starts decreasing again. It starts increasing, and again it tends to flat out. Okay, so this dynamic behavior is being recorded in the IFT behavior at different time intervals. And once we assume that after 15 minutes, for all the cases, it is more or less 
the equilibrium IFT is achieved. So this equilibrium IFT is what we have plotted in this diagram that is in point D. Okay. So this equilibrium IFT, as it is a function of concentration of alkali, so it decides to, what is the ratio of the ionized acid. So ionized acid group, which is ionized, and the unionized acid group that is there in the crude oil acid group. Okay, the acid group we are talking about the acid that is present in the crude oil. Okay, the ratio of this ionized and unionized acid controls IFT, and you can see a similar pattern follows. Initially, the IFT is pretty high, say around 18 to 20. It straight away decreased to around uh, uh, 0.45, something like that. Uh, no, 0 0.06 or something like that. It tends to the power minus two regions at 0 0.2 weight percent. Okay, and then it slowly increases, you can see, and then at one weight percent, we see we attain around 0.42 millinewton per meter is the IFT data. So as we have seen, okay, the IFT is being reduced, you know, by several units from around 18, it is reduced to 10 to the power minus two. So we found that it is very effective, and we were expecting that it should give a very good oil recovery. So keeping in view of that, we have done the flooding experiment. So when we did this flooding experiment, we are it was supposed to we are supposed to get higher oil recovery at the lowest IFT, which is at 0.2. But this is not the property that we have seen. So at 0.2, we are having around 11.3% recovery. And as we keep on increasing this alkali concentration, you can see the oil recovery increases and it almost reaches to around 25.5% at one weight percent. So you can see here, this is the diagram which says the rate of increment in the oil recovery is increasing as we keep on increasing the alkali concentration. And at 0.8 to 0.1, at 0.8 to 1 weight percent, the recovery is almost trying to attain a saturation position. So, whether you take 0.8 percent or 1 weight percent, if you go beyond that, the, the recovery is more or less a stagnant and it doesn't give you higher oil recovery. Now, why this enhancement in oil recovery was achieved, even though we are supposed to get a very higher oil recovery at lower IFT? So to analyze that, what we have done, we have taken the effluent, the exact crude oil that is coming out from the reservoir. The effluent, the effluent means, if you see the setup, I'll show you the setup which is here. This is the effluent that we have collected from the setup. After passing the effluent, the effluent that is collected, we try to analyze that. And once we have analyzed that, we have observed this emulsification behavior with the alkali. So at 0.28%, you can see, very negligible amount of emulsification was formed. As you keep on increasing the alkali concentration, you know, you can see at higher alkali concentration, the emulsification are pretty high. You know, more amount of emulsification is formed. So what this actually does? So when we're having this higher amount of emulsification, the high water permeable zone, which we have seen in water flooding is being retarded. So the water permeable zone is being disturbed so that emulsion, what it actually does, it in, when we inject this uh, chemical, it forms this emulsification, and the water that is coming behind this will try to it will, it will try to pass this water to the different parts of the reservoir. So ultimately, increasing the microscopic as well as macroscopic displacement efficiency, and this blocking of this pore by the emulsion, you know actually diverts the aquasphere to the different parts. So more contact area, so more displacement and more recovery. So that is why you can see at one weight percent we're getting higher recovery. But yeah, the emulsification extent is going to increase as we keep on increasing the alcohol concentration. Then why the oil recovery is not going beyond one percent? So this is the problem that we are facing is if you go beyond one weight percent, the emulsification droplet size and the strength is pretty strong. So it will not flow through the pores. So though it will block the pores, but it will be very difficult to take this emulsion from the pores. So ultimately more contact area, more heavy emulsion will form. So more blockage will be there. So that's why we need to have an optimum condition, the optimum condition for the emulsification at which we can have a higher quantity. So under this condition, we have seen at one weight percent, 25.5% is the maximum oil recovery that we could get for this particular system. If you go on increasing the alkali concentration beyond this, it will simply add 
on to your cost and it will not improve the or spike out your oil recovery so a lot of in this this kind of studies is already being reported but new in this that we have reported here is you know people have already said that acid group versus ift they try to take out some relation to what is the acid group and how this ift is changing okay the ift reduction was also observed for some crude oil which was not having any acid group so a lot of complex studies has been reported and there was no proper conclusion so we even try to attempt a relation where we are trying to find out the relation between the ift reduction and emulsification so that we can give some bridging between the oil recovery with these parameters but the ultimate thing that we have studied in this uh, article is we are going to have seen the emulsion quality what is the viscosity of the emulsion how the pore size throat you know pore throat size how this emulsion flows in this pore throat size what is the such size how the displacement is being changed so all these things is what we have studied in this flooding experiment by considering a very simple case normal formation water without any uh, higher concentration of diabolent ions and all very simple things is what we have studied in this and you can refer to this paper if you are interested that will give you a detailed idea of what exactly is being done in this paper so we have also optimized the flooding parameters like what should be the slug size what amount of slug should we inject so that it will give you higher oil recovery should we inject it in a different part time span or we should be injected in one continuous go okay so all these things is what we have injected we have seen in this experiment and we have concluded that at one with person we cannot recover more than 25.5 percent when we perform only alkyl flooding for the system and this is the mobility ratio you can see this is the mobility ratio and this is how when you have higher emulsion how it is being pushed into the surface okay. so this is what good or bad condition is what in between that we have to play to get your higher oil so uh, just a simple alkali like this we have done several flooding experiments that includes alkali for heavy crude oil reservoir surfactant for heavy crude oil reservoir reservoir rock of different nature whether it is sandstone reservoir rock or carbonate reservoir rock okay and all this is a general diagram i have taken so in all the studies we have identified all the parameters like you can see we have taken different surfactants cationic anionic non-ionic and we have seen the how they actually interact with the crude oil because this in some cases the heavy crude oil was not effective in reducing dft like what we have seen for the light crude oil so for such cases we have no other option but rather than to try out with surfactant so we have taken different surfactant of various nature and we have interacted it with the cooler just to see how effectively it can reduce the IFT. then we have studied the emulsification behavior the how the IFT reduction and emulsification are interconnected okay and we have taken surfactant, individual surfactant, mixture of surfactant, optimum chemical formulation depending on the reservoir properties and the whether it is rock or oil. Then that we have studied this emulsification, and you see we have after after when we, when we have also exposed the effect of different salinity because as I told you in reservoir you will be having different salinity of different compositions, so you cannot have universal optimum slug for all the reservoir. The optimum slug will keep on changing depending on the reserve properties so that is what we need to scrutinize to get the detailed idea so to do that we have seen that if we keep on changing the emulsification how the emulsification actually changes okay so if you see this emulsification we keep on changing as we keep on adding the salt okay so with salt the emulsification property will change and whereas the IFP, you can see we have seen the IFP in fact it reduces because what is happening when we have higher salinity, this in situ surfactant, rate of function of this in situ surfactant are more and it sits at the interface, so it reduces the IFT. But if we keep in mind that this IFT and emulsification needs to get interconnected, you will see that IFT at higher IFT to the IFT, at higher salinity to the IFT is to be less, but your emulsification rate is distorted. You can see there is minimum emulsification. So when you use this concept of data at higher salinity, you will realize that though we are having very minimum IFT that is essential for high recovery, but this will not lead to a high recovery because the emulsification extent is almost negligible here. So 
you need to find out certain condition ke, this shows ke how salinity can impact your optimum slurry. So we have seen all these parameters, we have explored this, so different papers are available in my website, you can go and visit my website, you can get this paper, it's already available. So this will give you an idea how different alkali is affected and different concentration and parameters will change the properties and how it will, you know, what are the various factors, because this is a very complex system and you need to reduce this complexity by exploring all the possible parameters so that you can have a very detailed understanding and a very precise flux for that, that you can select for higher on the group. Yes, any, any question? Okay, I hope I'm audible. Rao sir, you are audible. Yeah, okay. So, uh, and, and oh yes, weightability rotation is also one of the parameters. So remember all these things, what I'm talking now, a basic idea is already being provided into the introduction slide. And now we are into the weightability alteration. So you can see what we do, we saturate the rock sample with crude oil. Okay. And then what we do, we, in, we put a drop of the liquid phase and then we see the contact angle between them. Okay. So we, we, we can, you can uh, use uh, this drop self analyzer that will record this drop behavior with time. So you can see what the rock which is saturated with crude oil and once you drop this chemical phase, you can see how it is interacting with the rock surface and how the contact angle is changing. So you can see the change in the contact angle replicates how your uh, rock sample which is initially weighed by your oil is being replaced by this aqueous phase. Okay. So this signifies the more, uh, modification in the surface property from hydrophobic towards the hydrophilic. So once this is done, you can see the oil which is in the surface is released, and then you can see the released oil could be taken out because we have achieved a desirable condition of favorable water weight that gives you a higher percentage of oil. Then similarly, as I told you, okay, this surfactant when you're injecting the reservoir needs to be stable. So when you're injecting this surfactant at high we have uh, a reservoir that is having higher temperature. So in that case, you need to identify whether that chemical will be stable or not at such condition. So we have to do the stability analysis. So there are two different approaches which I have identified or used to identify the thermal stability. First is I have taken the surfactant and I have gone through this TG analysis that is thermal gravitational analysis which shows how at what temperature the surfactant goes on decreasing. So I haven't shown the data here, but we have found out that more up to 200 degrees centigrade, the chemicals are stable and it does not degrade, considering the chemicals that we have screened through this analysis. Okay. And since the surfactant will be there or the chemical will be there in reservoir for certain months, so what we did, we take the surfactant, we age it at different temperatures you know for certain number of days and then we take it out before aging and after aging and then we export it for different characterizations so you can see this black one is the ift uh, so fti data for your surfactant that is before aging and once we age the surfactant at a certain temperature for certain days expecting that the chemical will stay in reservoir for several months so we take this out and then we analyze and then you can see there are not there are negligible degradation in the functional group which further says that either you use the tg analysis which is the surfactant exposed to a different temperature a different time interval that method or this method where we have aged the sample for certain duration and then we have checked it the thermal stability both were saying okay this surfactant was stable to further verify that, we have identified the IFT value of this surfactant that is before aging and also after aging, and we have received more or less the same IFT value, which clearly uh, indicates that the surfactant are stable you know, up to a certain temperature range. And then, as I told you, that adsorption is an inevitable process. It will occur, 
and we need to look into this criteria so that we can have minimum absorption for our reservoir. So to do that, we have also investigated the adsorption studies. And in that, you can see this, this is one more paper available in the in my, in my profile where you can see how this adsorption is being affected with temperature and salinity and the reservoir properties. So remember, whenever you are having a reservoir, you have to identify the temperature, the pressure, the porosity, and probability, all these parameters. You have to identify then only you can perform this so we have taken this adjustment study using different model and we have seen this uh, for different rock samples we have already done this experiment and it is already there okay so these are the possible explore area for this chemical ur that is already being investigated few years back now the question is polymer polymer so here we are trying to expose Nanofluid flooding. Okay, so we have taken heavy crude oil. Okay, which we are trying to compare it with simple polymer flooding and polymeric nanofluid flooding. We wanted to see the properties of this nanoparticle in improving these properties because nanoparticle, when we use this, they have the same property more or less how the chemical UR does, but these nanoparticles are much more effective than chemical UR towards this mechanism that results in higher oil recovery. And what are those is what we're going to see. So you can see here, we have measured the IFT using the spinning drop tensometer. We have measured the emulsification characteristics. So there are a lot of the studies is being conducted on the microscopic image of the emulsion. And we have seen the cleaning behavior of those emulsion to predict the microscopic, uh, the emulsion properties. We have used geometer to predict the geological properties, how the system will behave, okay, and also weightability. So the first and foremost important thing when you're using the nanoparticle is you need to see the stability. So we have used all these characterization techniques to identify the desired properties that we want, and then we have performed this flooding. So what we have done is you can see here, this is the image. You can see the first part is A and the second part is B. So if you see in A part, we have polymer and certain nanoparticles, and this B part, we have water and nanoparticles. So previously, researchers had used nanoparticles with water flooding, and they were not the results were not encouraging because in their experiment they have not identified the stability of nanoparticles. Because if the nanoparticle is not stable in the suspension, then the properties in what we are looking for will not be effective, and you cannot have higher oil recovery. So the first thing that we have studied in our experiment is we have to try, we have seen the, uh, we were trying to change, check the stability. So what we did, we took a very, form, this is the formation water that we prepared synthetically in our lab, and this is the nanoparticle. Okay. So we try to mix it, okay, uh, keep it in suspension. So there's various techniques, like ultrasonication technique and all. So this gives the nanoparticles in suspension. And then you see after a certain duration, that is a duration of 10 days, the nanoparticles, which underwent the, all of it, all of the nanoparticles, it gets uh, aggregated and it settles at the bottom. Okay? So the settling behavior is quite high. Okay? Why? Because these nanoparticles, the electrostatic attraction are more, so the particles are coming closer, they form aggregate, and then they settle at the bottom. Whereas when you are having this, Nanoparticles in the polymer solution, you can see here, even after 10 days, these particles are stable. So if you increase it to a certain months also, we expect that this to be stable. Why? Because when we are injecting these nanoparticles in a polymer solution, this polymer solution, it keeps the nanoparticle in suspension. So the polymer chain is there, so nanoparticles is attached at this polymer chain. And because of this, in this case, the electrostatic repulsion force is pretty high compared to this case. So the nanoparticle force of electrostatic repulsion will be pretty high. So this will keep the nanoparticles in suspension region. So it will not allow the nanoparticles to come closer, agglomerate, and settle down, which we have seen here in the case of only water that is formation water flow. Okay. So since visual method is not a perfect way, to give you an idea about the stability. So apart from this visual observation, which is sedimentation behavior, we have also seen, we have also identified different characterization techniques like the DLSS, this is particle size and uh, zeta potential analysis. 
And we, if you see this diagram, this gives a clear cut idea. So you can see that when you have 0.1 with nanoparticle concentration, this SNPS is a silicon nanoparticle. Those are hydrophilic in nature. So you can see here the day one, what, what are the nanoparticles we're having? It is having more or less the same size in, uh, in day one and day 10. Even as we keep on increasing the nanoparticle concentration, 0.3 to 0.5, you'll see from point one, day one to day 10, the variation in the nanoparticle size is pretty less. So you can see these are stable when we try to measure the average diameter of the solution after a certain duration, that is day one and day 10. So this part, this says it is stable. And yeah, we have also done the zeta potential analysis. So maybe they will change the zeta potential analysis were shown. So we can see this is a stable. Yeah, we, we see that plus minus 30% is the value that predicts the stability of nanoparticles, but we could not achieve that. Why? Because in this nanoparticles, the echo space that you've used, it contains a lot of divalent ions. So this is the formation water, which is having some divalent ions that are collected from the reservoir. So because of this divalent ion, this interacts with the zeta potential value, and that's why plus minus 30 value is not, it could not be at achieved because of this interaction of the divalent ions. But through this visualized observation and the data that we get from DLS, we can predict that these are almost stable. The nanoparticles are stable in our chemical phase. That is the only polymer phase which we have taken here. IFT, as I told you, so what you can see, this is the condition. This is the polymer at 5,000 ppm. And you see when we add nanoparticles to this, the IFT decreases. And this observation was observed at lower temperature and also at high temperature. So a positive output is getting from this IFT, which shows that nanoparticles has the potential to reduce the IFT because nanoparticles, just like subtract and how it is forming missiles, these nanoparticles are also surrounding. So it is forming the same way it forms the emulsion, which we call as nano emulsion. And you can see here we have we have taken polymers. A different concentration polymers, okay, and then we have tried to see the effectiveness of these nanoparticles at different concentration. You can see here if you see this initially at zero weight percent, the nanopart the polymer emulsion is formed and it is getting destabilized. So, if you keep on increasing the nanoparticle concentration, you can see here this is getting more and more stabilized, okay. So, for all the cases, you can see the nanoparticles is showing some properties. So you can see here, it is having your emulsification behavior because nanoparticles, why it is showing that case? Because nanoparticles has large surface to volume ratio. So that could accumulate more amount of surfactant or other chemicals on its surface. So it is the interfacial free properties. So the oil water interfacial tension is getting more compact with more chemicals. So that's why you can see because of this large surface to volume ratio, there is high adsorption of chemicals in the nanoparticle surface. So the suspension and stability of hydrophilic and hydrophobic interactions are also getting improved. And because of such cases, you can see the emulsification is getting stabilized at, at a concentration, up to a certain concentration when we keep on increasing the nanoparticle concentration. But remember, it also has some disadvantage that we will see what are those disadvantages. But here you can see the inability to lower the IFT beyond certain concentration. You can see beyond 0.3, the IFT is more or less the same. And why is it so? Because once we reach this 0.3, we, we are actually attending a saturation condition. Okay? And if you go on increasing beyond this, the IFT remains more or less the same. And this will just add up to your cost. So that's why if you go beyond this optimum condition, this will not be fruitful. So from this data and for emulsification data, we have identified that 0.3 is what we can explore. But yeah, these are only tentative data because it is it will not predict the actual recovery. So to do that, we have to do some further analysis. So you can see here, we have analyzed this emulsion, what we have got here, we have analyzed it, and we have find out this droplet size distribution for all these properties. And you can see as we keep on increasing the nanoparticle concentration, you can see. Droplet diameter of 0 0.22 micron in absence of nanoparticles, but when there is nanoparticles, the droplet size reduces to 0 to 13 microns. Okay. And you can see a different weight percentage. You're getting 
you are getting reduced droplet size so smaller droplet size are getting formed and these are stable emulsion so that's why it helps in diverting the aqua stress improving the oil dispersion efficiency and low emulsion means poor coverage of polymer on the droplet surface that undergoes fast collision and to disturb this collision is what we are inducing these nanoparticles and you can see here these are stable form okay so we have also done this FECM analysis where we have this is a microscopic image of the emulsion. We have this we have done the FECM and you can see in here how these nanoparticles are being spreaded over this oil water droplet surface. Okay, so this shows how the packing of nanoparticles on the oil droplet surface can improve the emulsification extent, can improve the interfacial tension reduction phenomena, and this has potential to recover crude oil to a greater extent as compared to your chemical UR. And this is the creaming behavior. Okay, so this is a visual observation where you have observed the rate of creaming. And as you see here, this is the very first case. The very first case means at the beginning, the initial day zero, the, the time at which you have just formed the emulsion. So you can see no nanoparticles. So one weight person, 0.1 weight person, 0.3 weight person, and 0.5 weight person, three different compositions and without nanoparticles is what is formed here. So initially. They, there was no creaming, all were stable. Okay, and if you see on day one, you can see this is the creaming behavior. So the part when we are having no particles, the creaming it shows some creaming behavior. Whereas when there is nanoparticle, there are some creaming behavior, but it is almost negligible. As we keep reach to day ten, you realize at zero weight person nanoparticle and 0.1 weight person nanoparticle, there are some creaming, but 0.3 percent and five beyond that, there are no creaming. So this shows that 0.3 and beyond that could be the concentration that we can select. Okay, so that you can have this stable emulsion. The same condition was exposed to a high temperature at 80 degrees centigrade because we have just taken a tentative temperature because we want to just compare the how at high temperature the oil recovery will be affected. So you can see here when we are having this initially day, as usual, there are same. The emulsification was pretty high, so no creaming at all. Creaming index was 100%. And when we reach to day 10, you know, almost the the nanoparticle, the solution which was having no nanoparticles, or it, it goes to destabilize. So 100% creaming was there, so that's why its creaming index went to zero. Whereas at higher temperature with nanoparticles, though there are severe creaming, but still some emulsion was there, which shows that it is somewhat having a better profile. Then, with respect to in absence of nanoparticles, where it is totally zero. Okay, so we have also seen that you, you can see here we have also seen the uh, rheological properties. So you can see at different nanoparticle weight concentration how the viscosity was enhanced okay, at different shear rate. Okay, so the improvement in the viscosity was seen here with the addition of your nanoparticle. And this is the condition you can see here polymer where the viscosity that is obtained at different temperature. So you can see with this nanoparticles how the viscosity was changing. Okay. So this gives an idea about the geological property. So low creaming at low temperature and no creaming with 0.3 to 0.5 nanoparticle concentration as we have seen here. High temperature significant creaming. Okay. However, better creaming index in presence of nanoparticles. So nanoparticle gives better result than compared to in its absence. And the viscosity of emulsion is always greater than that of crude oil. So that's why we maintain the favorable mobility ratio, which pushes the oil from the rock surface to the production surface. So the real zero property is what we have seen in this case. And as usual, the nanoparticle concentration, as I was telling you, that nanoparticles it has some disjoining pressure. So we have seen how the wedge flame was formed. In the introduction slides, we have already seen how the wedge film was formed and how it was taken out to the surface is what we have already seen at the very beginning. So here we have taken we have taken this same nanoparticles and we try to check the weightability. Okay, so you, you can see here initially uh, we are having only polymer, the contact angle was around 85, 86 something. Then it came to around 54, 55, like 50 plus. Okay, so this shows that your reservoir, you know, we have just put a drop of it and we've measured the contact angle with time. 
So it, this is the pictorial diagram. You can see these are all reported at zero time period, time zero. So no nanoparticles. You can see the contact angle is reduces and reduces to a stagnant value. So it indicates that the reservoir wire more or less intermediate weight. Okay, so we know that our reservoir is intermediate weight. So now we are injecting nanoparticles and then we see how the weightability will be changed. So you can see here oil recovery. Okay, so before we do the oil recovery, we change the contact angle. You can see here. As we keep on increasing the alkali concentration, the contact angle reduces at the very starting point, that is at T is equal to zero. You can see here, this is at 86.2, which is no nanoparticle. When the nanoparticle was 1 weight percent, you can see it is 72.7. When the nanoparticle was 0.3 percent, you can see it is 66.5. And the nanoparticle concentration, when it is 0.5, it is reduced to 50.4. So you can see this reduction at the very beginning, you know, gives you a clear idea how these nanoparticles are effective in changing the weight and you can see when the nanoparticle concentration is pretty high the rate at which this it changes the weightability from intermediate weight towards the favorable water weight you can see it depends on the concentration of the nanoparticle and you can see how the we have reached to this contact angle region where the reservoir is more or less the favorable water weight condition okay so this shows okay, how the contact angles are effective in changing, uh, I mean, say nanoparticles are effective in changing the contact angle that results towards the alteration in the weightability. And you can see here this contact angle so reduces with nanoparticles, as we have seen here. So this when we have nanoparticles, they have a high electrostatic repulsion force within the nanoparticle. So this electrostatic repulsion force within the nanoparticle, it causes the particles to spread along the surface and because of which the absorption of nanoparticles from the oil water interface is, is, is uh, it undergoes the absorption of nanoparticles at the oil water interface. And then you can see the strong hydrophobic interaction between nanoparticles and water, which increases the surface free energy. And because of all these mechanisms, you can see the replacement or modification of the surface from hydrophobic towards the hydrophobic is achieved and the oils are being released from this rock surface so you can see now they will be away from the surface and once you use this chase water or any other means of flooding it will be taken out to the surface easily so as you see here we have studied this ift data emulsion properties in detail with all the size <laughs> distribution and the emulsion patterns and all the creaming index, the rheological properties. So whatever mechanisms were responsible, we have already studied. Now the question is, how should we predict? Based on this data, we could predict more or less 0.3 would be a kind of optimum kind of area, 0.3 or greater than that. So what we did to validate this result, we have done flooding experiments for all the nanoparticle concentration and then we try to analyze okay, what is the best outcome for higher recovery the best possible optimum slab for this nanofluid flooding condition so you can see here when we're having polymer flooding only polymer flooding nothing else we have a, we have achieved a oil recovery of around 14.5 percent so you can see here 14.5 percent is the oil recovery that we have achieved here at room temperature and only nanoparticle concentration, no nanoparticle concentration, only polymer flooding. And as we keep on increasing the nanoparticle concentration, you can see here at 0.1, we got around 16.3%, at 0.3, we got around 20.8%, and at 0.5, we got around 18.5%. So you can see here at 0.3 is what we're getting high recovery and at 0.5, we're getting lower recovery and why is it so as i told you the nanoparticles is reaching the saturation point and that's why the recovery is decreasing there is one more factor of recovering this nanoparticle at higher concentration which is the blocking of the rock pores because when we use nanoparticle concentration beyond its you know, optimum uh, condition it will try to agglomerate and it will try to block the rock pore throat and that's why this block pore throat will retain the oil in that and it could not be processed so that's why you can see at higher concentration it is decreasing so the flooding data is also confirming that point is the optimum condition and 
there is a pressure drop curve in this right hand side you can see that as we are initially when we are at zero nanoparticle concentration you can see this flooding data the pressure drop is increasing and then it is again going to the same level but as we keep on increasing the nanoparticles you can see the nanoparticles pressure drop curve is increasing and at point three we get high pressure drop so this indicates that there is a formation of the oil bank because of which there is a huge pressure drop that is encountered during the flooding experiment and you can see this pressure drop range is what we have got when we have injected this nanofluid at a certain pore flow. So 0 to 2 pore volume is only water flood and because it is reaching stagnation point here and from 2 to 2.5, 0.5 is the optimum condition we have received. So we are using this 0.5 and you can see this is the effect of this 0.5 slug why the pressure drop is seen here. And higher pressure drop indicates there is a formation of oil bank. And as we go on increasing the concentration beyond this optimum, you can see the, it is not going back to its normal condition. So there are certain lag in this pressure drop curve. This shows there is a blockage of this pores, and that's why it is not going down to its initial condition. So that's why you can easily identify that there is a pore blockage. So we have also identified this pore blockage by performing some. Uh, Characterization like the analyzing the FSM image of the rock force to which we have also seen okay, there is a blockage. Okay. And one of the important things is the effect of temperature. So you can see here, even though at high temperature we are having this methylene, still we could produce an oil recovery of around 18.5. So this shows okay, whenever you are having a reservoir which is at high temperature where your chemicals may not be fruitful. In such cases, you can blend your nanoparticles, you know, by performing this characterization techniques or analyzing this behavior that we have seen here. And then we can easily get a desirable oil outcome by performing this nanofluid flooding for reservoir which you are concerned of. Okay, so that's why you can see here oil recovery itself, it depends on pressure drop curve. High pressure drop curve is signified large formation of oil bank, which results in high recovery. So that's why you can see high pressure drop curve at point three and high recovery at point three. And pressure drop curve at 80 degrees centigrade is sufficient oil bank formation to increase the oil recovery. Even though when you're at 80 degrees centigrade, the pressure drop is this line you can see here, and that because of this, you can see you can get a promising result when you're implementing nanoparticle nanofluid for high energy. And as I was talking about, this other way of detecting the pore blockage is your FSM image of your nanoparticle. So you can see here, this is the core flooding. I mean, this is the sample before core flooding experiment. And this is the sample that we have received after core flooding experiment. So you see here, this is the image before core flooding. And when we did this flooding, you know, because of this, Pressure drop curve, which was saying okay, there is something, some block is happening there inside the pores. We can identify the FCM image. If you can see there is a nanoparticles which are getting agglomerated and they are getting, these are kind of blocking the pores because of this nanoparticle. There are some pore blockage. This is what you can we have confirmed from your from this FCM image. So you can see as per the literature. We have studied this nanofluid flooding and we have got an overall recovery of around 50.9, which includes 18.4, 18.5 from your polymer flooding and 32.5 from your water flooding. So this is at higher temperature. And when we are at uh, room temperature, the recovery was pretty high, that is 54.15, giving 33.3 by water and 20.8 by water to polymer flooding. So this is how we have identified the optimum formulation. So you can see nanoparticles adversely affects the oil recovery factor due to reduction in porosity and probability. So when you're going or when you're extending your nanoparticle concentration beyond optimum, that is 0.3 is what we've detected in this case. There will be a blockage, so it could adversely affect the oil recovery factor due to the reduction in the porosity and the permeability is hampered, so you cannot have higher oil recovery beyond certain range. And FSM image, which clearly depicts the nanoparticles do not get absorbed on the rock samples, do get absorbed on the rock samples to form these clusters as highlighted in red in this figure. 
And as I've seen, the oil recovery, it is a function of the ice reduction, emulsification stability, higher viscosity, weight of blood pressure. And those are what we have already explored here in this slide. So this gives a general idea of how nanofluid you know, can be implemented in your reservoir and how effectively you can remove the cooler from the surface. Okay. Next is, so this is a very simple experiment where we have taken this polymer and we have just seen how the nanofluid in presence of polymer and in absence of polymer, how it behaves and how the oil recovery is being you know, altered. You know. You can you can easily identify from this data itself. You can see okay, when you were not having any chemical, the recovery was uh, 14.5, and with chemical it reaches to around 21 percent. So you can see around six percent <coughs> recovery oil recovery is enhanced by the use of this nanoparticle. So likewise, you can see uh, there are a lot of data available where people are now nowadays since this is this is the emerging technologies a lot of people are working in this area to highlight the uh, impact or efficacy of this nanoparticles for higher oil recovery especially for heavy oil reservoir where it is very difficult to remove this plural and this is the literature review comparison you can see here this is the work that we have done here and these are all the works that is being done by the researcher where some of them you know people have used different nanoparticles like titanium dioxide silicon dioxide you know, aluminum oxide and many more but uh, there are a lot of uh, gaps that are there which we are trying to fill up so that you know we can find a desirable condition or you can get more insights of this nanofluid study that could be implemented into the commercial scale Next case is since uh, uh, we are uh, working on the surfactant cutting also, so we have already taken a surfactant that is a natural surfactant. We call it as Vita. We try to take this normal natural surfactant and we try to replace it with the synthetic surfactant, and then we want to see okay, how much effective this Vita surfactant is because when you use this chemical, it pollutes the ecosystem. So keeping view of such pollution, we are attempting to have. Uh, uh, we, are, we, are, we, are, uh, we were attempting to uh, develop some surfactant which will not or which will minimize this eco pollution. Uh, uh, I mean to say, minimize the pollution of the ecosystem. So, based on that, we've taken one uh, Vita fruits. Okay, this is available. I've collected this from uh, Guwahati Assam local market. So, I've taken the seeds. I have extract the pericra. Okay, and these are the four seeds. Okay, so this pericrab is being grinded into a powder form. Okay, and then it is extract extracted by your solvent. So this solvent extraction, it is being a syrup is being formed, which is then uh, exposed to a rotor vapor to dry the sample, and we got this final surfactant, which is the vita surfactant derived from the vita fruits. Okay, so we take the surfactant. This surfactant is we then blend it into this polymer because heavy crude IFT needs to be reduced okay to a very low range. So we took this Vita surfactant nanoparticles in polymer, we try to blend it, we try to see different properties, and we try to see okay, how much is the output that we have. Uh, I mean this is how much is the effluent oil is collected in the effluent so that we can have a higher percentage of the residual oil recovery. So this post, this interaction is being studied. So you will see, you, you can see here, we have studied the interfacial tension, the emulsification, the wettable tolerance, rheology and creaming and all, all these things is being exposed uh, to identify the potential of your retha surfactant. So what you can see, a more or less the same kind of investigation is what we have um, conducted. So you can see here, we have a Nanoparticle. Similarly, the same goes with this. We have taken the nanoparticles, we have studied the stabilization, and as usual, as I've said, in formation water, the nanoparticles are agglomerating, so the inter, inter, uh, uh, electrostatic interaction force are pretty high, so that's why they are getting agglomerated and they are getting settled at the bottom. And you can see these are 
going for your destabilizing process in this in this case the nanoparticles are not stable but where in this case when we have surfactant and uh, polymer so we have seen the, how these nanoparticles it has high surface area so it could accumulate more of the surfactant at its interface including polymer so that's why their electrostatic interaction forces are reduced in fact the electrostatic repulsion forms are enhanced and that's what you can see there are negligible or minimum sedimentation behavior okay that we have seen here so similarly as this uh, visual observation of sedimentation is not a correct method so same pattern we have done sedimentation analysis followed by particle size analysis and zeta potential analysis but to see how these, zeta, these are stable or not so in this case we have seen k all exploring all these uh, properties we have identified that the nanoparticles are stable at the chemical phase so we have taken once it is done we have in the same pattern we have studied the ift study so we have seen a lowest ift and lowest uh, droplet size of 5.45 micron at 0 0.3 weight per sub nanoparticles were also found in this case okay and as i have told you this nanoparticles you know it has large area surface area so it could accumulate more uh, chemicals on its surface so there will be a better interface packing at the interface and several other properties forms a very rigid film at the interface stable film at the interface which are quite effective as compared to your only chemical you are flooding okay <clears throat> so uh, this greatly controls the coalescence because i told you this electrostatic repulsion you can see because of this electrostatic repulsion nanoparticles are suspended and it will not coagulate and form a bigger drop and settle at the bottom okay so that's why the, this goes same with the nanoparticles as well as also with the oil droplets because the nanoparticles are covering the surface of the oil droplets so there's a packing kind of film that is being formed on the oil droplets as i have shown you we have already identified this by the efficient means so similarly we have studied the improved viscosity pattern like how the retention with nanoparticles was there so there is a steric hindrance kind of structure 3d macromolecular structure is formed and because of which you know the viscosity of the polymer or the aqueous phase is retained and it will not get destroyed and you will see a proper solid like structure block like structure pushing the oil to the surface would be attained so forming a favorable uh, mobility ratio and as i told you we were talking about this weightability alteration so in this case we have found it with weightability alteration of around 73.4 which shows that this intermediate weight it changes to 14.5 which is your uh, water weight and as usual this is because of the electrostatic repulsion force within the nanoparticles and particles to spread along the surface the same pattern how it gets the <coughs> Uh, change in the weightability okay we have seen you can see here this is the emulsion size and here you get a much more number of droplets a rigid kind of uh, a more stable kind of emulsion you know so there is a synergistic interaction because of this alkali or sorry because of the surfactant of polymer and nanoparticles and because of which you are getting you know a more stable kind of uh, emulsion film <laughs> emulsion properties and then when we do this flooding you can see here this in you can see here like more or less same pattern you will see when you're having no nanoparticles the recovery was a little bit high around 70 percent because we have sufficient um, as compared to the other case previous case and then um, you can see here we are getting around 25 percent of oil recovery we we'll get around 25 percent oil recovery which is also pretty much higher as compared to the case where we have used only polymer flooding here we have used polymer surfactant nanoparticles so you can see when we keep on blooming this synthetic natural surfactant you know it has the potential of enhancing the oil recovery as compared to the previous case the previous flooding data you can see here okay so you can see this data here this one is some gives you a lower recovery as compared to the one that we have used here when we are having this surfactant into the system okay. and like this way you can see the ift similar 0.3 weight percent is the optimum condition that we have also found for this case also 
and this case excess cases of recovery is pretty high and if you go beyond that there will be absorption process and you can see because of this FSM image again it identifies that there is an old blockage and you can see here the case is much more distinct here you can see at 0.3% and 0.5, 0 0.38%, it is somewhere going towards a lower value, whereas at 0.5%, it is not coming to its initial state. So this difference indicates that there is a adsorption. So at 0.8%, you can see it is more or less back to the initial condition at higher core volume. This is the core volume at which the core volume of the reservoir at which the product is being conducted. This is at 0.18%, so there is little more blockage at 0.3, little more, and at 0.5, it is highest blockage. So you can see the nanoparticle are actually blocking the top force. Again, identify the action image, predicting that there is a blockage and you need to stay at 0.3, and that is the condition where you're getting around 25% recovery. Initial volume phase is pretty high. So you can see. In this case, pressure drop indicates formation of oil bank, which results additional oil recovery of 25%. Okay, so this is the one which we are talking about 25%. Retention of nanoparticles in the rock pores affects rock porosity and permeability, as is in the same case. You can see in this image at the bottom right. So nanofluid flooding mechanism, which includes alka okay, uh, suspect and beta suspect and polymer, it gives you a good reduction in the interfacial tension between the oil and the aqua space the emulsification behavior good creaming rate okay good creaming behavior good, good creaming index and low creaming rate and weightability alteration changing from undesirable towards the favorable and finally by core flooding we could estimate the process how which you can recover around 25 percent of the heavy crude oil when you are implementing this natural Surfactant and the polymer. So this shows the potential of the nanoparticles. Okay? So a very few of the data is what I have seen here, but there are a lot of other studies that is going on. So you can refer to some published paper where they will tell you what are the exact roles of nanofluids. So there are a lot of possible areas where people are exposing. Okay, so if you're interested, you can look into some visual papers where they will tell you okay, how in the recent coming decade. People are extensively using this nanofluid for higher oil recovery. And there are a lot of things that needs to be considered, which I'll just give a flavor to you in the coming few slides so that if you are interested, you can work in this area and you can identify your you can identify your own gap so that you can uh, work in this area if you are interested. So uh, we are almost reaching towards the end of this topic. So uh, we'll see, we'll have a brief discussion of what we have seen so far. So you can see chemical and nanofluid for EOR is our topic that we have discussed today. So you can see chemical EOR, it has been already implemented in various parts of the world. So several fields where chemical EOR are implemented. So you can see some of the countries are listed here. And you can see it's an, all, it's an already an established technique, but implementation of this chemical EOR in real field is pretty complex. And I hope you have got the idea of the complexity that we have just discussed in this lecture. In the, in the previous slides, you've already seen how difficult it is because we're talking about the mother's art and it is very unpredictable, the porosity permeability. Everything will keep on changing as we go from depth to depth, from point to point. Even the reservoir crude or property will change as we go from one way to another. So a lot of things has to be taken. Several certain guidelines, like how to select screen, all these things, a guidelines needs to be formulated. So that's why people you can see, as I told, these are the countries where they have been implemented, and you can see it's been implemented and it's already a major success in most of the countries where they have already recovered the food oil using this chemical scheme, your scheme. Yeah, but chemical your scheme, as we see, a lot of chemicals are involved. So it's has some cost. So it, it says that chemical your is only promising when the crude oil price in the international market is pretty high. So if the crude oil price in the international market is not high, then if you implement this your you will not have a good profit. So that's why your are are used only when the price of the crude oil in the 
international markets are pretty high. Okay, so we have seen the chemical you are how they are being done in laboratory and how they are being successfully implemented in several parts of the world. And nano fluid NNC recovery is also what we have seen. Okay, in this class, and nano fluid how much it is effective at high temperature. So At high reservoir temperature, so you can easily identify the potential of nanoparticles when we are having a much heterogeneity system. And yeah, very important thing is nano fluid is not yet commercialized. Into you will not see uh, nano fluid flooding like how you have seen the chemical you are flooding because there are lots of limitations. So I have just shown you a very simple case, but there are. When you're talking about this mechanism, this mechanism itself is not clear because mechanism not those mechanisms are not stable and detailed investigation are missing. Okay, so you have a nanoparticle, how these nanoparticles are moving at the interface, what kind of surfactant, how it is having an interfacial packing, where, where how what will be the shape of the packing, what is the shape of the nanoparticle, what is the size of the nanoparticle, okay, and what is the crude oil, what is the in crude oil, you also have resins and other content uh, components, so that will also come to the interface. A lot of complexities are there, and that's why you can see because of this complexity, this has not been introduced into the commercial scale. So a lot of research are going on where people are trying to find out the gaps. They are trying to reduce the complexity so that a detailed understanding of this nanofluid uh, could be understood. So that's a nanofluid for oil and gas industry is a recent topic where people are exploring a lot of areas. To get a lot of information. Okay. So also there are a lot of data, but you need to you you should be wise enough to identify to what kind of nanoparticles should be used. It is exactly like the chemical you are, but it is a little bit more complex. So more detailed investigation is required to introduce this to the commercial scale. So that's why a lot of studies are still on the way. Okay. And that's why you can see a lot of publications are coming out. So this is one of the diagram the the pie chart that I've taken from the recent articles where it says okay, the people, those who are working initially in chemical we are now, they're also looking into this combined effect. So you can see here, these are the data where people are working in surfactant flooding, polymer flooding, and nanoparticle flooding. Okay, so the nanoparticle flooding is 12.3 percent of the nanoparticle percentage of the publications are coming out into the market, or you can see the general. Whereas polymer are very few and surfactants are 14 percent, but now alkali and surfactant is 21 percent, and other methods are 6.6 percent and gas is 15.6. But combined effect that is related to nanoparticles, ASP flooding, and other, it is going to around 25 percent. So you can see how people are extensively working and publishing in this area. So these are the percentage of the published data. So as I was talking. Okay, since we're talking about the nanofluid, you need to know what type of nanofluid flooding should be used, whether it is hydrophilic, whether it is hydrophobic, what is the shape of the nanoparticle, okay, the aspect ratio of the nanoparticle, the morphology of the uh, because of this nanoparticle, whether what is the film is for, whether it is stable, unstable, what is the charge nature at the interface, and a lot of factors are yet to be explored to identify the nanoparticles because with each nanoparticle you will have different mechanisms okay so that's why you need to study everything in detail and a wide scope area is open for people those who want to work in this area so that's why i've taken one slide which shows in future work what possibly we could do and what i am planning to do in future okay so if anyone is interested they can contact me because i'm going to work in this area in the coming few years so what we are going to see is we are going to take these nanoparticles, okay, of different shapes, size, type, surface areas, and anisotropy, and we are going to see how actually it could interact with the crude oil. The first and foremost thing is we are going to see the we are going to characterize the crude oil, so the saturated, what are the saturated, what are the aspartate, what are the resin, what are the aromatic contents, okay. Then 
we are trying to build a relation of this cooler of different percentage of SAR analysis to different types of cooled nanoparticles. We are going to see how the interfacial tension that is there is going to change. The interfacial tension, how it will interact. The emulsification, how the emulsification will behave. As I, as I was telling you, we need to see the cleaning behavior, the nano emulsion formation, and many more things is what we are going to see. The interfacial rheology, because the nanoparticles will be at the interface, so they will be subject to some compactness. So how it will behave at the interface, so to do that, we are going to see the interfacial rheology and not the bulk rheology. Bulk rheology will be there, but we are especially interested in finding out the interfacial rheology to which we can identify the exact behavior of these nanoparticles at the interface. And then we are going to see this binding or how these nanoparticles are binding at the interface or they are getting dissolved okay, at the interface. So there are a lot of molecule simulation where people are doing different methods to identify the, what is the amount of energy required to bind this nanoparticle at the interface and what is the energy required to get dissolved to dissolve this nanoparticle from the interface. Okay, how the weightability alteration is there. So uh, we're going to see these uh, nanoparticles of different types, whether it is hydrophilic, hydrophilic, how it will be. If it is hydrophilic, then what percentage of it would be located in the oil phase and water phase, and a lot of things we are going to see which will predict the weightability behavior for this. And as I've shown, a lot of the simple, this weightable alteration we have studied to some extent. We're going to see that in more details in, in the future because we cannot combine all these things and study. We need to find these are the parameters we need to identify individually and to get a detailed understanding of that. Okay. Because if you take all these things together, it will be pretty complex and it will be very difficult to analyze. Okay. So we're going to see this weightability behavior also, how this dejoining pressure is actually processing at high temperature and at high salinity, how the behavior changes. What is the trapping and retention mechanism means the nanoparticles will get trapped at the interface, it will retain. So what is the possibility that we can take this out? We can flow because nanoparticles is itself acting as a carrier of this chemical at the pores. So we need to find out okay, what could be the possible pore, depending on the pore size, pore throat, what could be the possible size we can take so that it would not retain and it is more effective, you know. And in, in that case, what could be how the possible way you can reduce the trapping and or the retention mechanism. So all these things we're going to see. And basically, the chemistry is what we're going to see, the electrostatic persons that is there, the van der Waals attraction forces, the steric hindrance, the capillary interaction. So this nanoparticles, when it is there at the interface, there is some capillary interaction, okay, the gravitational force, a lot of these things are coming into picture is what we're going to see in detail when we explore this area. And the immediate work which we're going to study, you know, in coming a year is we are going to develop this Janus nanoparticle. So there is different methods like soldier method, like where you can develop this nanoparticle. So this Janus nanoparticles are actually the nanoparticle that has half part of nanoparticle mass is hydrophilic and half part of it mass is hydrophobic. So now these nanoparticles, how it will orient, whether if it's a, it is hydrophilic and hydrophobic. So what will be the rotation of this nanoparticle at the interface? So this is all is what in detail investigation we're going to see. Then we're going to develop this Janus nanoparticle by soul gel method. Okay. So then you identify how these are being formed. We identify the proper formation of this Janus nanoparticle by the zeta analysis, the particle size analysis, SAM analysis, TAM, EDX, UV, TGA, FTR, XRD, and many more calculations are available there that we can use to validate your formation of your Janus nanoparticle. And then this nanocomposite or the nanofluid flooding, that the nanofluid formation that we're going to have with this, it will be exactly exposed to the laser band to identify its potential for oil recovery purposes. So this is what we are going to do in future, and this is our future work. So with this, thank you very much. I'm going to end my session. So if there's any question, you may please put it. Any queries from the audience? I have a small question too. 
Dr. Saha. Yes, ma'am. Hello, Dr. Saha. Are you there? Yes, ma'am. I'm audible. Yes. You have been talking about nanoparticles, and it's very nice listening to you. And it's a new area for enhanced cell recovery. And I just want to know that do you uh, did you study about the capture mechanisms also while doing the nanoparticle study? Uh, Ma'am, could you please elaborate what kind of capture mechanism you're asking? Is it that the interception? Yes, the interception, the interception and the staining capture mechanisms. Uh, did you study uh, no. on those? No, no, no. Actually, with these nanoparticles, the most we could reach is up to the realizable properties. We have seen okay, how these nanoparticles, the storage modulus, loss modulus, how it is behaving. So that is a possible we could do. Up to that, we have studied. But the capture mechanism and modeling and stimulus, actually, I'm also uh, planning to do this simulation, this simulation like multi color simulation, where people are using, they try to identify how these nanoparticles are being captured at the interface, their rotation, and all these things. So these are I, no, not the nanoparticles. I would like to say that the oil blobs, if it is captured by intercepted mechanism or by staining captured blobs, are they being released during the nanoparticles flooding through the porous media? Yeah, yeah, yeah. These nanoparticles, that's why we have done this flooding experiment. Where yes. Uh, uh, have you uh, seen, not, have you also tried your flooding experiments in the microfluidics where you can where you can observe the captured blobs oil blobs yeah the displacement is yes. what we're talking if i'm not wrong yeah so we we could not yes. do that but maybe in future we will plan to get some glass edge model where we can do this flooding with nanoparticle to have a pictorial view of the oil displacement and, and in that case it will be more clear of what we are talking about that release of this nanoparticle yes yes fine fine and that only i wanted to tell you that you can yeah, you yeah. can also enter into the microfluidics to understand the mechanism the yeah. shu and rapte 1984 to 87 papers relates the capture mechanisms you can go through yeah. those papers as well okay yes yeah, but it was a beautiful work presented by you yeah thank you thank you ma'am okay oh welcome welcome Hope to see more from you. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you. Okay, sure. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Do we have any more questions? Okay, so uh, uh, Dr. Ranjan, you can share my email ID. If anyone is interested, they can reach out to me. And in that way, it will be easier for them because I can understand my system is pretty complex and it might, it is very difficult. I, I don't know how much I could, give, I was in a way to give them a conclusive picture, but since the system is pretty complex and if anyone is having any kind of problem or any doubt, they can reach out to me with my email ID and I'll be happy to get back to those people, those candidates, even if they want some paper from my work also, I'll be happy to share it with them. Sure, sure. Uh, Sahasar, please tell me if there is, what is the size of the nanoparticles that are more efficient? I mean, in uh, terms of uh, really, uh, the size range that is more effective? Yes, there are some studies also where people have used different size of nanoparticles. And as of now, the data that we found, we found that the lower the size of the nanoparticles, the higher the oil recovery is. Okay. That is what is, I have seen in one of the review paper. But there, as I've said, there are, there are a lot of areas where people need to explore this. So size investigation is also one of the properties that we need to study. Okay, Because that will affect the pore throat size and properties of the uh, your this thing, uh, rock. So that will also have an impact. So we have to find out that optimum size for that right? for a particular result okay thank you and as i as ma'am was talking about this glass as model where we can see the displacement uh, yeah so we, we as of now we have we don't have that much facility where we can execute this but maybe in future we can develop a prototype model where we can work with this glass as kind of thing and we can give a proper displacement or you can do some simulation like star CMD where you can predict this behavior. So a lot of scopes are there which are open. 
Okay. If there is no other query, then I'll give my uh, last remarks. So on behalf of everyone present in the program and the organizing committee, I thank you, uh, Dr. Rahul Sahasar, for your interesting and insightful presentation on this important topic of nanofluid enhancement recovery. I believe that everyone enjoyed your lecture. So with your lecture, we understood about the different role of the nanofluids in oil recovery, how the different chemical oil recovery, sample recovery methods are employed. So it was nice listening to you, sir. So once again, on behalf of the Brigham University, thank you, sir, for accepting our invitation and speaking to us today. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you for inviting me for this talk. And uh, uh, I hope I have given a detailed review on this topic. And thanks once again. So there was some technical glitch at the beginning because of which I could not focus, maybe because of some network connection and all. But I hope it, the talk is almost clear to most of the audience. And as I have said, if there is any issue, if they wanted to contact me, they are always welcome. So with this, I'll also end. And I think I should, uh, if it is possible for me, should I leave now or do I have to stay? Yeah, you can leave. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, okay, thank you. Thank you. So with this, we come to the end of day one of this FDP. So I thank all of you for joining the two lectures, two sessions. My sincere thanks goes to the resource persons who's for sharing their knowledge and expertise through their talks. So I will send the attendance link, the, the feedback link through email and also in the WhatsApp group. So I had sent the link, but there was some issue. I'm resending the link once again. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, these two sessions of day one. So please join us tomorrow at uh, 10 a.m. for the third session of the second day uh, of the FTP. So we shall meet at 10 a.m. tomorrow. So thank you once again. Have a nice evening.